Thank you, Arno. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, so I don't need to introduce myself. I'm not going to anyway. I do need to, but that's for another time. Um, so I'm going to uh, reflect on uh, the history of GMOs and the questions of precaution in relation to GMO regulation. Uh, science precaution and innovation towards the integrated management of new technologies, or was it governance, uh, was the title of this conference. And that does actually raise some broader issues about precaution and GMOs, which actually the programme has me talking about tomorrow. You might regard that as slightly back to front, but that was in the accidents and contingencies of organising the programme at all this conference, which I want to thank the magic of Diedrich, wherever he is. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Diedrich, for doing that. Um, but on GMOs in particular, um, EU regulation of GMOs um, has formally been precautionary since the very start, since 1990, when the 1992-20 directive on the release of GMOs to the environment was established. Uh, the 1990s saw lots of scientific controversy um, and indeed political controversy too, uh, thanks to, and a lot of the science actually as well, thanks to NGOs and direct action of various kinds, uh, that kept scientific debate and further learning about GMOs and their environmental effects alive uh, through the 1990s. Um, but the, the original directive was updated um, and changed in 2001 with the, the law which is still in place, 2001-18. Um, and in particular, that directive uh, in a way, re-specified uh, requirements which hadn't been fulfilled since 1990 in the regulation as then existed of GMOs. Um, so it, in particular, emphasised the need, the requirement for risk assessment to include addressing indirect, cumulative and long-term effects, which in the preamble it was agreed hadn't been properly uh, uh, assessed in the previous decade uh, of regulation of GMOs. And these are, almost by definition, the kinds of possible effects which can't be assessed only on a case-by-case -case basis. The very, very good reasons, common sense as well as science, for saying we have to have a case-by-case -case assessment of each GMO, each specific GM organism as it's developed and put forward for a possible release to the environment. Uh, but there's a lot more to the consequences of releasing such organisms to the environment than it is actually incorporated in a case-by-case -case assessment only. So the conclusion, which is something that still is waited for in respect to GMOs, is that we have to have case by case, yes, but we also have to have some formal way, an accountable way of assessing long-term, cumulative and indirect effects, including indirect, meaning interaction with other factors and other kinds of agents in the environment. So that's the starting point, really, for the question of precaution, precautionary principle, in relation to GMO regulation and risk assessment. Um, we're still operating with that directive, although, of course, there's been the further question since come up of gene edited organisms. I'm going to talk more about that tomorrow, if you'll forgive me. I'm going to concentrate for the moment on what the shortcomings are of existing <laughs> regulation of GMOs, because gene editing, gene edited organisms don't yet exist, certainly not in front of regulatory assessment. 
There are no dossiers for approval at EFSA on gene edited organisms. So, uh, for another time, but there are questions about gene editing which are also relevant to the precaution principle and what I'll talk about tomorrow. So, the assumption that I think Eric mentioned this morning in his presentation, um, th which the Commission makes in its 2000 uh, communication on precaution, precautionary principle, that um, precaution is only an issue for risk management and not for risk assessment because it's assumed that risk assessment is intrinsically precautionary. Um, that's the assumption that's made. So we don't need to involve any policy commitment, explicit formal policy commitment to precaution, which is addressing the science and shaping and influencing the science. That is a false assumption. I think Eric declared that this morning. If not, or in any case, I'm also declaring it now. It's a false assumption to assume that risk assessment itself is precautionary. And we have to have, as he explained, policies which actually determine a precautionary approach on the part of the risk assessment scientists too. And that's what we failed to achieve. And policy has failed to achieve it. So, uh, and the scientists themselves in the risk assessment process have failed, failed to achieve that. So, with respect to GM, then, that's the general point about risk assessment and regulation and the, U, the Commission's um, understanding of what the precautionary principle means. Um, and even the US National Research Council's <laughs> Red Book, as it's called, on uh, risk assessment, risk management and risk communication in 1983, even the Red Book actually accepted quite explicitly that there is a need to actually be <coughs> deliberately precautionary about the various interpretive steps and challenges and bridges, as they call them in that report, which science is making in risk assessment. So with respect to GMs in particular, um, the, the first and major point that continues to this day, it looks as if it's going to continue for a while longer yet, is that basically, uh, for example, the, the vast majority of existing GM crops sold commercially globally are actually herbicide resistant or they're BT inserted, BT uh, pe pesticidal GMOs. So basically the assumption is made by the Commission that you can separate entirely the risk assessment of the pesticides involved from the risk assessment of the GM crop itself. Now that's a questionable commitment and yet it's framing all of the risk assessment which is carried out on GM crops. There are all kinds of interactive effects questions and there is evidence too, scientific evidence, that there are interactive effects which need further research. They don't prove unsafety, and that's not what the scientific authors of those articles have claimed. What they say is there is indicative evidence that needs to be further investigated. EFSA has basically refused to recognise that, so that that research is not being done by the Commission and indeed other bodies. And what's more, it's not demanded of the proponents of those GMOs, the commercial interests which develop and put forward and sell those pesticides and the GM crops which require them is not required by <coughs> the regulator, in this case the European Commission or EFSA, of those proponents. So there's an immediate and pervasive fundamental shortcoming of the existing regulation of GM crops in Europe. Um, so, this point about separation is indeed um, multiplied many times over by the fact that 
since about the early mid 2000s, stacking of GM crops has become almost normal practice. The vast majority of new, the vast majority of new GM crops put forward for regulatory assessment are stacked events. Anybody need, do I need to explain that perhaps? Stacking is the process whereby multiple traits, so multiple insertions are made into the host GM crop or plant in order to actually insert multiple traits into the crop concern so that you might get herbicide tolerance and pesticide resistance, pest, you know, insecticidal properties into the same crop. So you get multiple benefits from your one uh, sowing of whichever crop it is you're talking about. So stacked events are multiplying now partly because actually of the increased resistance which weeds and pests are showing to the original herbicide tolerant or pest insecticidal GM crop which was introduced in the first place. And this was known about by the commercial corporations who were doing this development back in the 1980s as a more than a likelihood. They knew this was going to happen. And basically the responsibility for that happening has been passed to farmers because it's basically a result, they say, of the indiscipline and the fecklessness of farmers all around the world for not actually introducing the uh, GM free zones around the crop fields and so on, which is, you know, part of the supposed conditions of GM commercialization. So that stacking introduced almost like, um, as the uh, Catholic priest Ivan Illich called it long ago, iatrogenic medicine. We start introducing and administering new medicines in order to control the effects of the previous medicine, which we took. There's a very similar thing going on with GM crops here and their regulation. Uh, and the issue of responsibility and its distribution is a very pertinent one in this kind of case too. But further than that, and then I'll have to close, that there's, a, there's an assumption made by the regulators that if the issue is what is the environmental or health risk of, say, an introduced, GM introduced uh, insecticidal BT protein, then the, the risk assessment can be done reliably for the crop, which is the question, crops are commercially introduced and sold and transferred worldwide. The risk assessment question for the crop can be done by testing the pure protein itself, produced not from, extracted from the GM crop, not extracted from the GM crop even, but actually produced by bacterial uh, processes. So you're testing something which is different from the real crop in the real world. And that counts as precision risk assessment or precision knowledge. But you ask the question, is it actually realistic and reliable to do a risk assessment that's based on fiction? You're excluding so many of the questions that are pertinent about the risks from GM crops by saying, effectively, we know what the process is of GM insertion of the BT generation by the GM insertion. We know all about that process and we control it. Therefore, we don't need to ask any questions about any possible unknown changes to the post plant genome that were introduced by the genetic manipulation process. And that's precisely the point. The EU legislation was introduced originally on the grounds that we have to risk assess the process of genetic manipulation as well as the products, all the various individual products themselves. The individual products themselves, of course, include the pesticide GM combinations, increasing in their um, scale and intensity as stacking develops as a commercial and technical practice in itself. So there's a question, I'll come back to this tomorrow and elaborate in more detail,
relating to GM regulation, which is precision and control, assumed control, okay, um, or realism. I would suggest that at the present time, EU legislation, as well as elsewhere in the world too, is actually founded far too much on the principle or the assumption of precision, as if that's the only way of doing good science, and not upon the, the question of realism, getting the right conditions under which we can actually assess these kinds of products in a proper precautionary way. But a lot more to be said, but we can get back to this tomorrow and maybe also this evening in a public event. Thank you.